Heated metals expand. Cooled metals contract. In this film, we'll look at some of the consequences of the expansion of metals. Physics in action in the world around us. First, a demonstration in the laboratory. We hang this piece of metal from a metal wire stretched between two supports. Now we pass a current through the wire. This causes it to heat up and the wire expands. It gets longer and begins to sag. Increase the current further, the wire begins to glow red hot and sags still further as it expands. Turn the current off. The wire cools and contracts again, back to its former length. Current on again. It's expanding once more. By the way, it's nothing to do with expansion, but what sort of process makes the wire vibrate like this, do you think, when it gets hot? When the wire cools again, once more it contracts to its original length. It's possible to measure the expansion of a metal and find what's called its coefficient of linear expansion, or expansivity. We use this apparatus in the lab, and more accurate methods in industry and research use the same principle. We're going to measure the expansion of brass in the form of this brass tube. Let's look at the back. Just here, there's a thin metal shaft, a sort of axle. When the brass tube expands, it will rub against this shaft, causing it to rotate. The dial attached to the shaft will rotate with it. At the bottom, supporting the brass tube, there's an accurately made micrometer screw. One complete turn of this screw pushes up the brass tube exactly one millimeter. There's the dial rotating as the brass rubs against the shaft. We must note the dial reading when the brass tube has moved that one millimeter. It's 53, 53. Now we measure the length of the brass tube from the point where it rests on the micrometer screw to the point where it just touches the shaft of the dial. It's nearly 43.8 centimeters say 43.75 centimeters. This thermometer measures room temperature. The brass tube will be at this temperature. It's 25.7 degrees C, 25.7. We're going to boil water in this vessel so that the steam passes through the brass tube and heats it up. A thermometer up here will give us the temperature of the steam. Here we go. After five minutes or so, the water's boiling. Steam will now pass into the brass tube and heat it up. This will cause it to expand, rotating the shaft and moving the dial. Watch. It's now expanded as much as it's going to. We must note the new dial reading. It's 34, 34. The brass tubing's now at this temperature. About 99.3 degrees C, 99 Later, you can work out the coefficient of linear expansion of brass. 
It's important for engineers especially to know how much different materials expand on heating. Railway track expands on warm days and contracts when it's colder. On the old-fashioned type of track, gaps are left between each 60-foot length to allow for this. There'll be another gap 60 feet away. Modern track is welded into 600 foot lengths or more. This needs a much bigger gap to allow for expansion, so the joints are arranged like this. You can see how the rails can slide past each other as they expand or contract. Those lengths in the middle keep the whole section rigid wherever there's a joint. So on modern track, there's only a joint every 600 feet or more. The concrete beams used in many big civil engineering projects also expand and contract with changing temperature. Gaps have to be left to allow for this. There's going to be a road surface laid on top of these beams, part of a big new motorway interchange above the railway. But you can't leave open gaps. They'd fill up with debris, and then they couldn't fulfill the purpose they're intended for. So the gaps are filled with flexible plastic material, as you can see. And the beams are laid on strips of flexible plastic, which will give as they move, because of expansion or contraction, or with traffic vibration. This section is nearly finished. Once again we can see where gaps have been left, filled with flexible plastic sheeting, so that they don't get jammed up with bits of grit or other solid particles. This is the stuff they use. It comes in sheets which are trimmed into shape. Without such precautions, structures like this would crack and split with the stresses caused by temperature changes and vibration. In big steel structures like this motorway bridge, there's even more movement caused by expansion and contraction. This is how it's allowed for. The girders rest on these rollers. Here's one seen from inside, just below the bridge. This is how they work. When the temperature rises, the long metal girders expand, and this happens. When it's colder, the girders contract and the roller tilts the other way. Here we are under the bridge again. Above the rollers, there are special expansion joints in the roadway. On the surface, they look like this. The metal combs interlace with each other like fingers, moving in when it's hot, sliding out a little when it's cold, but always bridging the gap between the two sections of the bridge. The ends of the bridge also rest on sets of rollers so that they can move as the metal expands or contracts. And there's another sort of expansion joint in the roadway above. Watch out for devices like this on any big civil engineering project. They're an essential part of the design if the structure is to remain safe. If you visit an electricity generating station, you'll notice how movement caused by metals expanding and contracting and by vibration is allowed for. The huge pipes, for example, aren't fixed rigidly to anything. 
They're suspended by strong steel cables with big springs to allow for movement. Otherwise, they'd soon split under the strain as they were heated up on starting the turbo generators and with the vibration caused by the hot steam rushing through them. See how this great steam pipe is mounted on heavy metal springs. Here's the front end of one of the high pressure turbines. The whole long chain of machinery forming the turbo generator expands when in use and contracts on cooling. It's fixed in the middle but can slide over greased metal plates at the ends, like this one. The machinery expands in this direction when it gets hot It can slide on this heavy metal plate. This bracket's fixed to the machinery and you can see from the scale on the base plate that movement has taken place. Again, without precautions to allow for movement caused by expansion and vibration, this vast plant would quickly wreck itself. So far, we've been dealing with the problems caused by thermal expansion, but we can make use of the phenomenon. You've probably seen a demonstration like this. This is a bimetallic strip, brass on one side, fixed to steel on the other. Now, brass expands more than steel for a given temperature rise. So if we heat up the bimetallic strip, this happens. On cooling, it straightens out again. Here's a use for bimetallic strips in the direction indicators of motor cars. When we switch them on, current flows in a coil of wire wrapped around a tiny bimetallic strip. This heats up the strip so that it expands and bends and makes an electrical contact which lights up the flasher bulb. But at the same time, this cuts off the heating current, so it straightens out again and breaks the connection with the bulb. But this restores contact with the heater current, and the strip bends again, and so on, and so on, until we switch off. Other flasher units work in different ways. Examine one for yourself to see exactly how it works. Making use of thermal expansion again, and again in connection with the motor car. This toothed ring is the ring gear which fits around the flywheel of a car engine. It engages with the starter motor when you switch on the engine. It's accurately made to be completely circular, like the flywheel. But as you saw, it's just a bit too small to fit. So, it's heated up. After some time, it has expanded, uniformly, because it's accurately machined. Now, it should just fit onto the flywheel. It does, and as it cools, it will contract and grip the flywheel so tightly that it will have to be machined off if it has to be replaced again. Instead of heating something and shrinking it on, we can do the opposite. This ball race will not fit onto the shaft. Each has been accurately machined, but they don't quite fit each other. We place the shaft in liquid nitrogen. This will cool the shaft to minus 196 degrees C, and the metal will contract. After 10 minutes or so, we take it out, and now it will fit into the ball race. leave it to warm up again.
The shaft has now expanded to its former size and there's no way we could get the ball race off. Let's look at an application of this liquid nitrogen technique in railway engineering at British Rail Engineering Limited's crew works. They're working on the cylinder block from the engine of a diesel electric locomotive. These holes take the cylinder liners, but they've been drilled to make them circular again after they've gone out of shape in use. Metal inserts are used to narrow the holes down to their original diameter again. They won't fit until they've been cooled in liquid nitrogen to make them contract. The circular channel is now full of liquid nitrogen at nearly 200 degrees C below zero. The insert is put into it for 10 minutes or so. It has now contracted and should just fit into the cylinder block. Let's see. And there it goes, neatly into place. When it warms up to ordinary temperature again, it will expand and fit very tightly into place in the block. Here's another application of thermal expansion on the railways. There are metal tyres on the wheels of many locomotives and other rolling stock, which get worn by friction against the rails. Here's a new tyre for a wheel on a big diesel electric locomotive. It's heated by gas jets all around it to make it expand so that it will just fit over the wheel. It's now ready to take the wheel. When the tyre cools, it will contract onto the wheel and stay there. Just like the ring gear on that motor car engine flywheel earlier on. These high speed trains don't have tyres. The entire wheels are in one piece of tough steel. But the same technique, shrink fitting, is used to fix the wheels onto the axles. These wheels have been heated in an electric oven. They're accurately machined with centre holes just too small to fit on the axle. But when the wheel's been heated so that it expands, it will fit. Watch. They've got to work quickly. Can you think why? And here it goes, 